a little bit. Hey everybody, uh, Charles Eisenstein here with my dear friend, Becca Young Allen, Rebecca, Becca, I always call her Becca. Uh, she's the director, executive director of the Andes Amazon Conservancy, which um, is doing in incredible work in, well, the Andes Amazon uh, transition zone, uh, where, where there are um, crucial wildlife corridors that are being threatened. Um, but maybe I should let, maybe I should let Becca talk about that. Um, but, it, but I guess I'll just say that this project um, has, has really inspired me because it works on so many levels at the same time, uh, ecological, cultural, uh, dare I say it, spiritual. And, and it's the, you know, not, not, none of these, um, you know, we, we, we tend to silo these things off in separate domains, uh, but ultimately they cannot be separated just like the Andes and the Amazon cannot be separated. Uh, just like if two organs of your body were separated, they would each begin to wither. Mm. And so we have that, uh, you know, in our society, the, the, when we divide up life into separate realms, each begins to wither. Mm. So anyway, um, uh, Becca, do you want to, uh, have I so far given a accurate description of the uh, work of the AAC? <laughs> you made a beautiful start there, Charles. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for taking the time with me today to be able to tell this story a little bit. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, you know, actually, before I even get into the big picture of what we're doing here, I, I think I want to start with a story of, of one of our collaborators, um, Tsunki Kahake, who is a Shuar gentleman who has been um, a part of this program from the beginning. It's been about five years. He's one of the early collaborators. And Sunki remembers, he's, he's, a, I don't know, he's in his 60s now. Um, and when he was a young man, he was living in the rainforest at the base of the Andes Mountains um, in the traditional ways. Um, this was before development had moved in. And he tells the story of what it felt like to the people when the first road was cut through the land. Just that first cut. And they felt it physically in their bodies as if their own body had been cut. He said it was like a knife through our hearts when the land was severed in this first way. And um, that's just a very small example of the ways that the being body of the Amazon basin has been cut mm -hmm. many, many times. And so I think I want to now like roll back a hundred million years um, because the Amazon forest is purported to be about a hundred million years old, which I can't even conceive of as a northerner where, you know, all of our landscapes were scraped down to bare rock 10,000 years ago, the last glacial cycle, you know, for life to be able to be in a state of constant generation for a hundred million years is extraordinary. It's just extraordinary. And so over those hundred million years, there have been long scale cycles. When the glaciers move into the Andes mountains over thousands of years, whole forest communities from the tiniest being to the largest creature slowly move and migrate down into the foothills and out into the Amazon basin where it's warmer and there's no ice. And then again, when the ice recedes 15 to 50,000 years later, over thousands of years, those same forested communities will then migrate towards the foothills of the Andes where the cooler microclimates exist at the base of the Andes. So it's this long scale cycle of flow between the Andes Mountains and the Amazon Basin that has been a part of what is generating the astonishing biodiversity of this region. It's so beyond uh, like human comprehension. Like they, they um, did studies and found uh, 100,000 species of insects in one hectare. Like 
That's just, wow. yeah. yeah. It's like what, it's so beyond, you know, this mind's understanding. And so what the highest level work that the Andes Amazon Conservancy is doing is to maintain pathways for connection that will allow these ancient evolutionary processes to continue as best they can within the context of everything that is happening on the planet. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what you've told me, excuse me, what you've told me before is, is how there's like a 2000 mile long development corridor that's almost severed uh, the Andes and the Amazon, but there's this couple hundred mile intact connector. Yeah. That, and that's where the focus of your work is. That's correct. Yeah. So, and and really, you know, the story I told about Sunki in the beginning was was the beginning of that mm -hmm. of that severing about sixty right. years ago. Um, the development began because it's just beautiful areas. So, of course, the humans want to be there. And so, um, if you look at a large uh, satellite map of um, South America, you can see this giant uh, wall of development that goes from the Caribbean all the way down to the northern part of Peru. And it is um, very, very wide in some places and narrower in other places. But there is one place in Ecuador that um, is still open. Um, I wish it was 100 miles. It's not 100 miles wide. It's really more like 10 miles wide. So it's very small. Wow. This is the strategic, very, it's like the acupuncture point that we're targeting for our work. And it's this location that is so key to keep open and maintain um, that connectivity. And so in that area, um, you know, there's the capitalistic economy has has come in and, you know, it's really devastated so much of the land and the culture already. Um, so there's, there's other strategies that are at play there. We have two primary strategies that we're using. One of them doesn't sound very sexy, but it's conservation land use planning. And this is allowing the communities, and I just want to say first off that this entire program is being run by currently 75 indigenous communities that live in Ecuador. Um, across four indigenous nations. So these are the Quechua, the Sapata, the Shiviar, and the Shuar nations. These are the nations that we're working with currently. And it's, it's their program, it's their project, it's their land. And they are really guiding this. We're just providing the ideas and the tools. And then everything is being led and facilitated by the indigenous people. So um, conservation land use planning is preparing for a hundred years of population growth because we can't just plan for now. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have to plan for the future because it's going to, you know, populations are going to grow and expand. And so, you know, a lot of times in, con in, I'll call it 20th century conservation, we think about protecting an area and I'm using air quotes around that protecting because what that means is we wall it off kick out all the people and then say, there we go, the land is safe, even though it might be surrounded by development on all sides. But we know based on connectivity principles, like if that land isn't connected to other land, it will wither. Just like, as you say, like if one organ is disconnected from another organ in the body, both will wither. And right. so, and that's also kind of conceptually walling human beings off from nature and saying, like we, we grant the assumption that Human beings are a, a curse on this planet. That's right. Uh, but, you know, that's not true of the Shuar and the, the others that you named. That's they correct. were living there for, you know, thousands and thousands of years and were a blessing to the land. And that's so, correct. so yeah, that's, that's, um, so now we're not, but you're doing 21st century uh, conservation. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not about walling it off, kicking the people out. No, the people are essential because they are the stewards of the land. And, um, you know, you know, there's, there's, a, I was read a really interesting um, science article a while back talking about that the Amazon um, rainforest is essentially a giant garden that has been propagated by human beings over 
thousands and thousands of years, that so many of the species that are there are there as a result of this reciprocal relationship between the humans and the land over time. Yeah. So no, we the humans are are we have a we have our our purpose on the planet. We do, and our planet is to is to love and steward the land that we um, you know are the gift of the land. And so, rather, what conservation land use planning is doing is rather than having isolated areas of protected land with development around it, it flips it upside down. And it says the human development will stay in isolated islands and the and then everything in between will remain open and flowing. And so um, that is what is happening on a fractal scale from over 75 communities. And so each of those 75 communities is agreeing to maintain their population, um, human activities within a 12 square kilometer zone, roughly, which accounts for 15 fold population growth and the um, amount, you know, uh, land needed for um, agriculture as well. And, and then everything in between is considered a, a, a protected watershed or biodiversity reserve. Some areas have hunting allowed, some areas have hunting that's not allowed. And so these, these knit together um, over vast distances and great acreage to create a network of what we're calling eco-cultural corridors. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we're creating a new term here as opposed to bio corridor, which is a very familiar term to the conservation world. But we're using eco-cultural corridor to really center the fact that the humans, the culture, is woven into the process and not separated from the process. So there's a network of eco-cultural corridors that when complete will stretch for 175 miles and will comprise... Six, six to eight million acres of land. And this, honestly, Charles, is just a tiny drop in the bucket. I mean, it's uh -huh. like, it's, it's so insufficient and it's so necessary. Yeah. You know, the, the um, story that you started with, um, the man who described the road is feeling like a knife cutting, cutting through himself. Um, like, you know, we could talk science i know that like adam on your team is is you know deeply versed in the science of of bio corridors and yeah. and you know you spoke some of the uh the function <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> the function of that area um in turn in in times of climatic shifts mm -hmm. and and you know the number of species and stuff and You know, I kind of, it brings up to me the question of how, how shall we be guided and who do we listen to and, and, and how do we listen? Yeah. And, you know, I kind of, when you told me that story, that was kind of all I needed to know, <laughs> you know? And I yeah. wonder, um, and, yeah, and then when we speak of the, you know, actual science that coincides with that man's perception. Um, it, it is, it maybe it, it's affirming, you know, to, to the other part of me that is conditioned in a scientific way of thinking. But I wonder, um, How much, like how you, how you navigate in in carrying out these these projects, you know, like because like you said, it's it's maybe overwhelming, like the scale of what's actually needed, you know, and and you're just a a few people, and <laughs> like where do you begin, you know, like like, and and I imagine these. Uh, I mean, there's been other other you know NGOs that go in there, and sometimes you know honestly leave more harm than good in their wake, and so so how do you like? I guess I'm asking many things at once. Um, one of them is how do you build trust? You know, um, another is how do you 
know what to do and what to listen to mm. when you're a newcomer there. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and how, how, do, how are you different from NGOs that come in there and here's the science and here's what we have to do. And mm. well, you know, this indigenous people are very in the way or, or maybe we have to pay lip service to them or like, like what, mm -hmm. what's different about what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's very few newcomers up that are a part of the organization. <laughs> there's really very few. It's, mm -hmm. it's, so for instance, a um, lot, of, lot of beautiful questions weaving in there, Charles, how do we build trust? We begin with the fact that for every indigenous nation that we're working with, we have a traveling team, a male, female traveling team that is from the communities. They are the emissaries. Mm -hmm. They are the ones bringing the word. They are the ones that are going from village to village and talking to people. So, you know, um, and in the times that um, I've traveled along the river and have gone down with um, Adam and some of the other um, northern team, um, <laughs> you know how we build trust is through music. <laughs> yeah, we, we go and, um, and we partake in the community's rituals. One of the most important one is the drinking of chicha and the passing of chicha, with, which is a fermented yucca beverage. And so we, we sit and drink chicha for a really long time and share songs back and forth with the people. Um, so that's one of the ways. Um, and and how do we listen? What do we listen to? One of the first things Adam does when he goes into a community, and this is Adam Jeb, who is our founder, um, is he talks to the elders and the hunters. And he asks um, what they've noticed about their wildlife populations over the years. And do they remember the time when there was giant wildlife populations migrating up and down the rivers? And they'll just, they confirm, they confirm all of the like conservation principles, you mm -hmm. know, just for, with their own stories. Um, so those are, those are confirmed. Um, and <clears throat> when we're working with a community, what happens is that each community elects a small um, committee, a, a small selective group that represents the will of the village because the consensus decision-making processes of each community are really essential. And those, the consensus decision-making is what guides every choice that's made. And so we have this select committee. And um, one of the things that we added in this last year, which is really, really key, is our grandmother program. And so we, we compensate a grandmother to be a part of the committee to help guide what is usually younger people that are part of this process. Mm -hmm. But as we bring different conservation decisions to the committee, ideas for them to um, consider and play with, um, then they'll bring those ideas back to the larger community for the consensus process, which is long. And you know it might take 10 hours of sitting in a circle and everybody sharing what they have to say until they come to what they agree upon. And then that what they agree upon is what is enacted in the process. So it is not fast. This is a slow process. And um, the indigenous consensus governance model is at the center of it, pretty much at every level that we work on. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we build trust really slowly. And um, it's not linear. I can tell you that it's not linear. Sometimes, you know, fear will come through a community and they'll say, we don't want to work with you anymore. And we'll say, okay, that's fine. And we just wait. We just wait. And it's, you know, in the beginning, when I first started this job, I would get really anxious about that. I'm like, oh no, they're leaving. That's terrible. And then I've just learned by watching that you just wait. And then, and then the fear passes and they draw, you know, um, sustenance from the other communities around because that's that's so grassroots. This is spread from community to community because the communities speak of, of the trust that they've developed with us. And right. the communities share with their neighbors why they want to work with us. And so it just spreads organically. And now we have a waiting list. We can't 
actually service all of the communities that want to participate. And we have another indigenous nation that wants to participate. And we just have to kind of tell them, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're not, we're not there yet. We can't do it, but um, it, it's, so, so, so basically your role, you know, in this, so it's, it's very grassroots, but you, the, the Northern team, uh, you're playing uh, an important function. You're kind of bringing information in um, that's necessary for them to, to interface with the legal system, you know, with the, with the government, with yeah. um, funders uh, yeah. abroad, right? There's all kinds of, because also um, you are funding some of these grassroots activists. Right? Absolutely. Right? Like every yeah. single committee is funded. And so we're funding over, I think it's like probably about 180 people right now across mm -hmm. the communities, just in the communities, including grandmothers in each community. Is like, that where most of your budget is going? Um, well, that's a giant <laughs> portion of the budget. There's a lot of budget that goes into travel because mm -hmm. the majority of our communities are 100 miles past the last road, which means that uh -huh. every trip out requires a, a small plane trip, <clears throat> land on a little grass airstrip. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the back and forth there, that's, that's th that and funding our, our team. I mean, we have a, we have a indigenous team of 25, mm -hmm. the leadership team in Ecuador, and there's only two, two white people, uh -huh. <laughs> everybody yeah. else, everybody else is from the area. Uh -huh. um, so, um, yeah, the, the majority is going to human beings. It's going to the humans and then, you know, food and, you know, we bring gifts to the community, which is usually right. food. But it's really important to, to give that kind of funding because, you know, one of the ways that development encroaches is people, you know, uh, need money, uh, you know, as the economy becomes more monetized, as right. traditional life ways are eroded exactly. through many means, uh, through, you know, the loss of, of habitat that supports traditional life ways through um, uh, schooling, which separates people from subsistence ways like all those things come in and you know all of a sudden people need money and the only way to get it normally is to join in the development process yes. and and contribute to the further erosion of the basis of those life ways so if you're coming in with an alternative yeah. it doesn't even have to be that much money like i was really impressed with the amount like the the the, the territory the number of hectares that you have protected you know, per dollar. I mean, yeah. it's like 10 or a hundred times more than what a lot of NGOs do. Yes. You meaning cheaper, less expensive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, by far. Oh no. It's, it's very, <clears throat> it's very cost effective. I mean, this is the thing, Charles, like this, this model is a fractal model that is both scalable and replicable mm -hmm. and can and should be applied all around the Amazon and all around the world in any places of global um, hotspots of biodiversity that we really want to keep from crashing. So it's, 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 it's really a great model. I'm, I'm excited about, um, you know, the world getting to um, give it a run. <laughs> um, it really works. So you said there's two things. One was conservation land yeah. use planning. And what was the That's second great. one? Okay, so the second one is really that's perfect because it really ties on to the more of the economic challenges. So out in the deep, deep rainforest, the cash economy hasn't really impacted people out there. There's nothing really to spend money on except gasoline, which is like gold for sure, because, you know, they need um, gas to run the powder uh, canoes that go up and down the rivers. That's their roadways. Um, but at the base of the Andes, the development has been much more impacted and the cash economy has just devastated the communities. There's so many people that are no longer speaking their native language. It's just it's it's heartbreaking. Um, and in this area, the, the rainforest has also been really fragmented. Mm -hmm. And so our strategy here is edible forest planting. And so this is covering a lot of things at once. Number one, it's reintroducing over 20 indigenous species that used to be widespread, but have been um, over harvested and taken out. So we're reintroducing these um, trees. Now these um, fruit and nut trees like the Marete palm, when mature can produce between two and 400 pounds of nuts 
per tree. This is a very, very culturally important tree because of the fact that it produces so much food. It's incredible. And so what we're doing with the Edible Forest Initiative is st very strategically planting in areas to create reconnection between rainforest that has been fragmented from itself. And so we plant in the areas that have been fragmented. And then this is providing, number one, economic opportunity for the people that are planting and tending and doing all of the work of the nurseries. And number two, it's creating in, I mean, geez, everything grows so fast down there. It's between five to seven years that trees will reach a level of maturity that they can really pr be producing food. Mm -hmm. so this is producing food, not just for the humans, but for the wildlife that is migrating along these ecocultural corridors, but then is also the abundance that will be created will feed the humans. And also, you know, if whatever over whatever is um, not eaten by either human or animals can then be brought to market. So so that's the, the longer term plan on the edible forest initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. We've got, you know, two nurseries and just gorgeous trees growing. And um, right now they're being, our first crop of trees is being planted and they're being planted along the waterways because the waterways, the rivers and the stream beds are the, are the channels of migration for wildlife. So these are the areas that are getting reforested in uh, 35 meter swaths. And then <laughs> once we get the first 35 meter swath planted, then we'll move out and we'll just keep planting outward from the waterways. So it's, it's a dual um, strategy of the edible forest combined with conservation land use planning. So we're planning for future population growth, we're planning for agricultural needs, and then planting where we need to do repair. Yeah. Do you, um, you, do you have any, um, yeah, so I, I, I get the big picture here and, and I think it's pretty clear. And I wonder if there is, uh, if there are any like stories you could share that, um, by giving us the little picture, mm. actually help us understand the big picture. You know, mm -hmm. like something, something that that kind of sums it all up, or something maybe that it doesn't sum it all up, but but it feels like this is close to the heart of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Is sure. anything you'd like to share? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. Um, like I said, this is a fractal process. The mm -hmm. same process is applied at the micro level as applied at the macro level. And the smallest fractal of this is the population growth area. So that's a 12 square kilometer zone where human habitat um, is going to stay. Now, within that, um, when, when our indigenous leaders go into the communities, they'll ask the communities, are there things that you want to conserve within this area? And for instance, um, animal salt licks are really important or the streams and waterways within that area or um, a wetland zone. And um, we'll, we'll sort of send in some maybe Northern numbers like, well, for instance, a good stream setback might be considered 50 meters here. And what we find is that the communities want to go to the highest bar possible for conservation. So instead of saying, well, we want to have 50 meter conservation, they say we want to have 300 meter conservation. And that's the bar that, that they want to go to in their heart. It's like, oh, no, no, no. If we want to have clean water for the future generations, then we need to make sure that this is utterly protected. And so just this idea, just this concept that when, when, you know, the people determine what they want for their own land, they choose the highest bar possible for conservation. So that within that um, 12 square kilometer population area, then there's all of these mini and micro quarters that are created for my, for wildlife migration within that. So again, super fractal from the micro to the macro guided by the people and the heart of the people. What they want is they want the highest level of conservation possible for the land. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that that same dynamic plays out, you know, all over the world. Um, so often, environmental controversy, environmental uh, conflict, is basically global forces versus local forces. Yeah. You know, like like it's the local people who are opposed to, you know, an incinerator, you know, or a whole bunch of wind turbines, you know, right. or you know, uh, a strip mine, you know. And because people, <clears throat> they, they, people naturally fall in love with the places where they live. Yeah. And unless, you know, we're cut off from those places. I mean, now a lot of people are cut off by technology and can move from one place to another with actually zero impact on their day to day mm -hmm. lives. But, mm -hmm. but when people are, are in daily communication, with the plants and animals around them and, and the rivers and, and are directly dependent on them in ways that they can see, then they naturally fall into the role of the defenders of those places, yeah. you know, unless they are cut off or so pressured economically that they have to um, ignore That's that right. their heart's calling to, to take care of their place. Yeah. And that's really what's happened at the base of the Andes because the people are really forced to deforest. And mm -hmm. you can see there'll be, you know, as you drive down the road, you'll see logs stacked kind of, um, you know, crisscrossed. And um, over time, you watch the size of those logs get smaller and smaller because they've harvested the big trees and now they're coming down to the smaller trees and coming down to the smaller trees. But if the cash economy has invaded, there's no other options because the right. wildlife has already been so deeply impacted in this area. They can't live off the land in the same way that they used to 60 years ago when the land provided all of for all of their needs. And there was absolutely no need whatsoever for anything to do with something called money. But that's changed now. And that's why the edible forest is so critical. And again, it's like, um, um, necessary but insufficient you know and um and so um yeah that's why it's so vital to be doing this mm -hmm. in a much wider way in a much much wider way so so now you are um uh raising funds not only to continue doing this work but you said you're going to expand to another nation or like what are what are some of like what's the big vision um if yeah. there is one yeah. yeah. Well, the big vision is um, is connecting between two major national parks, one in the Andes, Sangai National Park and Yasuni National Park in the Amazon on the border of Peru. And so the so the big vision for Ecuador is is connecting between these two national parks, 175 miles. Um, the larger vision is that this is actually a pilot program and that we can then take all of the principles and processes that we've learned through hard knocks, figuring it out as we go here, um, that we can bring it to other locations. And in terms of expansion, like, um, again, it's, it's a network of connected ecocultural corridors. And so we can expand as far as we want to go in Ecuador, for sure. Um, and then over into the over the border into Peru would be phenomenal. Um, and yeah, it's it's I'm going to say funding is challenging because we are kind of flying in the face of standard practices, conservation practices. It's like new paradigm, big time. And mm -hmm. um, and so it's a little confusing for people. Um and it's it's absolutely essential. And I, you know, in so many ways, I feel heartbroken that we are wedded to the current like paradigm of philanthropy, um, which has got so many problems woven in throughout it. But we are like we're bridging. We're bridging between mm -hmm. stories, right, Charles? Between the beautiful new story, and um, and so in that bridging process, we are beholden to the philanthropic philanthropic model. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm just, my prayer, and I do hold this as a prayer, is that when people hear the call, hear this call, 
They'll feel it in their bodies. They'll feel it as sort of a whatever, that beautiful warm sensation of like, oh, yes, like, you know, this has been funded right now because of two people that really felt and heard the call in -hmm. addition to other foundations and things that we've applied for grants for. But, um, you know, to be able to um, bring these resources directly into the communities. I mean, one of the things that we hear when we go into the communities, um, first of all, don't abandon us. That is literally the first thing that they'll say is don't abandon us because it happens all the time. NGOs come in with their big ideas and then they run out of funding and they're gone. And that's a legit reality like that. That can happen. You know, you run out of your funding and what are you going to do? Like there's no other resources for that. So um, that's kind of my like the thing that I hold in my heart when I'm doing all of the development work is like, don't abandon us. Like, no, I do not want to abandon you. I want to make sure that we have, I mean, come on, the resources on the planet. We know how inappropriately everything is skewed right now. It's just so out of control. And, you know, the amount of resources that are needed, you know, in a few million dollars, like nothing, nothing. Yeah. I know there's like literally billions going into climate change philanthropy. Yes. And, and, you know, excuse me, gosh. The, the, so there's billions going into climate change philanthropy. Yeah. And it's very based on metrics, you know, like how many, you know, megatons of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions is this going to lower? You know, it's, it's very, um, because, and, and I can understand why, you know, they, they want to make sure the money's well spent. Um, yeah. you need some kind of objective measure of it. Yeah. Uh, but what gets left, left out of those metrics are things like, um, the, the, the necessity of, of healthy migration patterns of wildlife to distribute nutrients and, and keep the forest healthy. Like it's really hard to say, okay, well, how many, tons of CO2 sequestered, does that translate into? Yeah. Like you can't actually see it through that lens. Yeah. You can't see the, the, the importance of living networks unless you're looking at earth as a living being Yes. and, and measuring and measuring if you can measure at all, measuring its health by something other than the quantity of a single substance. It's a completely different mindset. And that, that, mindset, that holistic mindset that that is not just ecological but cultural too. That holistic mindset um is is very it's 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 you know kind of cutting edge uh yeah. and and unfamiliar to traditional philanthropy. But I think that there are um there is an awakening, you know, among in, in in philanthropy, just like anywhere else, like every institution of our culture is having an awakening from within. And so I do think that there are philanthropists and funders who are like in like this kind of understanding and and wanting to put their resources, um, you know, in places that that like the kind of things that you're doing that mm-hmm. are tapping into a, a holistic understanding. And um, so I don't know if there's uh, any of you listening to this, <laughs> um, uh, I'd love to put you in touch with, with Becca mm-hmm. and yeah. the Amazon, the Andy's Amazon Conservancy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It, it, I don't know. Do you have anything, any comment on that, mm. Becca? Or, or uh... yeah. Well, you know, I'm. What what came back to mind was this idea of how much um, billions of dollars are going into climate philanthropy right now, and I I honestly cannot think of anything more important than the protecting the resilience of the Western Amazon for the planet right now for the whole. Right for the whole planet. Like the Eastern Amazon we know is in dire, dire trouble from deforestation and drying, incredible drought that's happening there. We know what that does to the water cycles. So protecting and 
the resilience. This, this is the most resilient landscape maybe in the world. And so, so holding dear in our hearts, this most resilient landscape, this jewel of the planet, I believe is the most important climate action right. we can take right now. And so again, it's like, but which lens are we going to look through? We can look through the lens of, of carbon sequestration, but, but the problem is that the way that is generally measured right now is if there's imminent deforestation at hand. And so mm-hmm. they say, oh, we're protecting this from this deforestation. But what if we're just protecting it, period? Like, we're not worrying about deforestation in the deep rainforest at the moment because the people are living in right relationship and they don't need to deforest, right? So it's like, again, all of the rules are slightly um, skewed. And I know they're working on biodiversity credits and all of these stewardship credits. And there's there's new mechanisms right. at play. And those are the ones that I have my heart set on because of mm-hmm. course it's not going to happen fast enough for us because we need resources now. But, um, but I, I do believe that this work is honestly the most important work in service to the, cl- in service to creating a resilient climate, which we desperately yeah. need to support. And, yeah. and I know that your whole book, Charles, that you wrote on climate really, affirms that, you know, if we're just taking care of the water, for instance, let's just right. take care of the water. And yeah, I, love- I said, if we're going to focus on one substance as yeah. a measure of Earth's health, it should be water exactly, and not carbon. Not yeah. that carbon's not important, but water is life, as they say. If water is life, indeed. And another thing that, that I, uh, I think I wrote about in that book is, is the idea that, that, um, the deep Amazon, it's like it, if you can preserve the deep Amazon in health, then there will always be like a reservoir of health, like a, a, an example of health, like, like a place where earth remembers what it is like to be healthy. And if you can preserve that, there will always be hope because it can radiate its health back out, uh, to the rest of the planet. Uh, but if you, destroy that, the heart of the planet, then where on earth does, does earth remember what it is like to be healthy? Exactly. Yeah. And and you're working right in that, that deepest, deepest heart of the planet. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And like just circling back to what I started with a hundred million year old forest, Mm -hmm. right? Because life's, uh, you know, Mother, Mother Earth's natural functioning is over a very long cycle of time. And we humans have been here for a blink of an eye. And look what we've done in that time. And yet, if we can stop causing harm, just stop causing harm, she'll rebound. She's mm-hmm. incredible. Just stop causing harm. And so that's what this work is doing is just it's, it's halting human impact and again, very, um, it's very natural for communities to want to spread up and down rivers with development. That's very natural. It's like we would want to spread up and down a road here, like the rivers are their roads. But f- so for the communities themselves to say, we will constrain ourselves to this area and not do it as easy and convenient mm-hmm. by developing and moving our expanding along the rivers like that is what is going to maintain the resilience of the forest. And that's so inspiring. Like these, these are people who, you know, own very little and face a lot of hardship. And for them to say, nonetheless, we will yeah. restrain our development. It kind of puts the question to us, you know, mm-hmm. like what kind of restraint are we willing to yes. exercise here? If they're going to do it, you yeah. know, it kind of, it's like, well, maybe we could consider doing that as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and as I've said, there's a waiting list. We have a waiting list, mm-hmm. we have a waiting list of communities that want to join. And we have a waiting, we have another indigenous nation that wants to join. And, you know, right now we have to say no. And it's just because of financial resources. Like, How, how do people, if, 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 if people are, you know, in the funding world, and I mean, is, are you going to, are you doing like, like, like 
mass fundraising where where are you, like people give twenty dollars? You know, do you have that, or is it more like your um, like how, how do if yeah like who are we speaking to now if we're talking about funding? Yeah, so we're you know <laughs> all every every um, size of offering is so welcome and 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 it's like it's it's kind of like i you know i know you've talked about in the past charles about the newtonian concept of having to have a giant force in order to create a giant impact right mm -hmm. and so i want to say that you know every dollar that someone feels to divert from some other you know avenue into this is so 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 welcome um and you know our um, very stripped down, like super lean, don't expand, just maintain right now. Budget is about $75,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And that it takes a lot of $10,000 grants, which is what I'm writing right now. Right. To get to that. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous. So every amount is welcome. And what we really need to, are to find the people for whom resources, large scale resources are, are nothing, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm. we, yeah, I can give you a hundred thousand. That's, that's like breakfast money for me, you know, because we know that those people, we know that the way the resources are getting concentrated in the hands of the few, yeah. that those few that, that have the concentrated resources and are really hearing the call, hearing the prayer, hearing the song, of this new paradigm of conservation yeah. of this you know, you know, <clears throat> okay, it just it strikes me though the people who will actually do that are not the people who will, will see it as oh this is breakfast money for me they're yeah. the people who are holding their money so sacred mm. that they mm -hmm. want to use it mm. in the most beautiful way that they can mm. i love you know? that and, and so it's not like oh this is kind of throwaway money i might as well give it to the ac it's, right. it's people who are holding their money in sacred trust Mm, mm. You know, and maybe they've inherited it from their their families, you know, their ancestors. Maybe they've inherited it from an earlier time of their life mm. you know, when they were mm. um, doing something with their their gifts that brought a lot of money. Yeah. And and, you know, either way, they have it now and they recognize that 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 through fortune, through the gifts that they have been given through, mm -hmm. through, you know, whatever has brought them this, that, that like, wow, you know, what mm -hmm. do I do with this to, to that, that, that matches my sense mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this is sacred, yeah. you know, like, and that's why I wrote the book, Sacred Economics. <laughs> I, I was like, like, why is money less sacred than everything else? Right. You know, like, why have we, have we divided the world into mm -hmm. the profane and the sacred? Mm -hmm. And, and how can we reclaim the profane for the sacred? And so one of the ways to do that is actually to hold money as sacred. Mm -hmm. Because what it is actually it is um, the uh, means by, by which you can coordinate human activity and direct collective resources. It's like a powerful magical implement. It is indeed. And, and so the, the, there are people who recognize that and um, who will Who, will, who yeah who who will recognize the resonance um mm. uh between what you're doing mm. and their own feeling mm. uh that that their money is actually sacred you know too sacred to buy a, to spend on a yacht <laughs> you know what i mean yeah it's, it's I not do. yeah it's, it's not do. that that they're it's not even necessarily restraint you know it's more of a recognition Mm. of what this is for. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's the kind of person, you know, like I, I, uh, I mean, I don't, don't want necessarily people to be putting their, their, you know, grocery money into the AAC, right. but, but people who, cause there are many, like, I think it's, it's, it's also a sacred use of money to provide for your family, you know, of course. Of course. But, but there are people who have, have, have 
more than is necessary to provide for their families. Yeah. And then like, that's the real question. What do you do with it then? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like, and, and it's tough. Like I, you know, I know philanthropists who are, <clears throat> uh, who recognize the limitations of philanthropy mm-hmm. and how, mm-hmm. how, and the whole culture of philanthropy and the tax laws and all of these different forces that mm-hmm. kind of channel it into things that are still kind of part of the old story, you know? And, and so I think that those who are um, feeling the limitations of that and, um, you know, uh, uh, and really ready <clears throat> for a different, <clears throat> excuse me, a different paradigm um, will feel a natural resonance to the AAC. And that's, I guess those are the ones that I really would like to connect with, yeah. connect with your work. Thank you, Charles. And, you yeah. know, it really brings back to mind our very first, uh, our fun, our founding funder who um, made a lot of money in Bitcoin mm. and said, well, what is this for? This isn't for me, clearly. And he was deeply involved in um, medicine communities, people mm-hmm. that are working with medicine plants and um, at, when he connected to the spirit of the medicine plant, she said, this is, this is where this needs to go. This goes to the Amazon. This is where I was born, and this is where I need to be protected and saved. And, mm-hmm. and, and so that was how this all really got rolling, was an, one funder really hearing the call. And that's, that's been true with, with another funder that we have that has really heard the call. And it's and um, this this woman is a um, has is an elder and who's been a climate activist her whole life. Okay, so like mm-hmm. 45, 50 years before anybody knew anything about, you know, climate activism. And she said, "This is the first time that I feel like, after all of those years of all of those actions, this is the first time I feel like my resources are going towards something that's going to actually that actually can do something that can mm-hmm. actually work." And so, yeah, it's really like, again, do you feel the call? Do you hear the song? Do you feel it in your heart when you hear these stories? And um, if so, I'm here and so excited to have, I'm happy to do presentations for anyone that would like to hear the whole story. Um, And you can, and for anyone that just wants to make a donation right now, you can go to our website, which is aaconserve.org aaconserve.org and um, you can make a donation there and on that donation page it has um, a link to my email so that if you want to reach out to me directly you've got a larger contribution to make and you want to have a conversation yeah. you can reach out to me directly there yeah yeah like like becca has actually a very professional set of materials and everything yes yeah. kind of not my style to like go through with you know that slideshow but um yeah. but yeah you're it's really impressive actually what you guys have have created, you know, from so little. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Charles. And I remember, you know, first telling you the story a couple of years ago and, you know, you heard it right away. You're like, oh, this is different. This is different. How can I help? And at that time we were operating um, in what we call stealth mode, which was, we were just trying to be so quiet about Mm -hmm. what we were doing because we, you know, we knew that it was really, really effective and we didn't want to agitate any of the systems to come in and create a response to us. And, you know, my prayer over the last couple of years is let us sink our roots as deeply as possible so that when the winds blow, we are, we're rooted and solid and Mm -hmm. we can handle the blowing winds. And um, it is only recently that, and this has really been guided again by our indigenous team, of 25, it's been 100% led by them. And they have recently, you know, expanded on what they're willing and allowing me to share. And Mm -hmm. so now our website for so long really didn't show much of anything, because I couldn't show anything, because Uh it just didn't feel safe to people. And now they've given their permission. So now there's pictures of our team, and they made a beautiful video. And they're just they're they're really excited now to share with the world what we're doing. So so now you know we've sort of taken the lid off, and now we get to tell people what's going, what's really happening down here. And again, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Which doesn't mean it's easy. Okay, it's also really really hard. But that's okay. All all good things are a good challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. Well, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing, sharing about it, you know, um, and I hope that uh, good things come from our conversation and um, um, yeah, and I, I really, um, I guess one of those good things might be, <clears throat> and um, some other people falling in love with what you're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and new relationships being formed. Yes. Yeah. The web grows and expands this beautiful web of connection of all of these people across the planet that mm. are really in service to that new story and, and want to, want to birth it in all of the places. And this is our, our small contribution to that new story. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Charles, brother. I'm just so grateful to you for your support these years and for your willingness to share. Yeah, I really care about it. You know, it's one of those things that, that like, I mean, I've never even been there, you know? Yeah. Um, we'll get you down. We'll bring you yeah. down. Someday, down someday. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Oh, Thanks, Becca. Thank you so much, Charles. All right. Let's see.